inspiration and authority of God's Holy Spirit, the Apostle Peter writes, And who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness, say, you are blessed, and do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it is better, if it is the will of God, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. 1 Peter is a letter which was written primarily to a church that was undergoing persecution and suffering at the hands of not only the Romans and the Greeks, but also as well from apostate Jews, those who had rejected Jesus as the Messiah. And basically, 1 Peter was written to encourage the saints to maintain their walk with God, to develop their ability to present the gospel, and, but especially to remain faithful and to encourage and love one another. In verse 13 and following, we have the specific context here, but verse 15 is the one I want to focus on this evening for our particular lecture, and that is, <clears throat> but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a reason to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. It's that word reason that I want to talk about in the word defense. Those are two things that we need to think about in terms of this particular series, which I've entitled Defending the Faith. And the point is, is that sometimes when you talk about defending the faith, people say, well, God doesn't need to be defended. No, he doesn't need to be defended. But he actually has given us a responsibility to give a reason for why we believe what we believe. And this first segment, we're going to be dealing with covenant baptism. We'll then be doing things like the five points of Calvinism. Then we'll go on to general apologetics later on. But this verse is kind of cool and kind of crucial because this word defense here is a word in Greek is from the like apologia is the word in Greek. And it's a, basically the literal translation is a word for. And in Greek culture and in society and the usage of this particular word, a lawyer who stood up to defend you in a court would give an apology, an apologia, a defense for who you were and what you didn't do, what they said you did. Now, we still use the word apology today, but we use it wrongly. We use the word apology in English to refer to saying, I'm sorry, right? You know, I did something wrong. That isn't really what the word originally meant if you go back and look at the etymology. Basically, it was an explanation of why you did what you did, why you said what you said, and why it wasn't wrong or bad or insulting, or why you did what you did and it wasn't evil or a crime. It is an offense that's been given. So what we have here then is a straightforward commandment from Peter to the entire church that we are to sanctify the Lord God in our hearts, and they are, we are always to be ready to give a defense. In other words, we're supposed to be able to say to people why we believe what we believe. Why do we do what we do? It isn't just because we have some nebulous, some abstract, some intellectual comprehension of some reality out there, but rather there are actual reasons why we believe what we believe and why we do what we want to do. Now the problem is this, is that faith and reason are often put up as adversaries to one another. If you've got faith, you don't need reason. That is contrary to what Peter says here. But in my entire Christian experience, I probably went almost 10 years as a believer, and I kept running into this statement. And I swear, out of the love of God, and out of, out of, out of appreciation for His glory and majesty, the next brother who says this to me, I'm going to give him a holy punch in the throat. When someone says something like, oh, you just got to take that by faith, I want to give that brother a holy strangling. Because the Bible does not tell you to take faith in blindness. It isn't a, a blind obedience to something, but rather it is a reason faith. There's a reason why we do what we do, and we're supposed to be able to articulate those reasons, to tell people why we believe what we believe and do what we do. Reason is simply a process of thinking. And Okay, so we're going to get a little bit technical, on, I guess, in this first part here, but I want you to understand that. Reason and faith are not opposed because reason is simply a way of thinking. It ensures that the conclusion that you reach logically follows from the premises that you've established. Faith is what establishes the premises. Reason then attempts to work out the implications by the evidence that's available. For us Christians, that evidence is usually scripture. 
for other people, but we can also bring other things in, like science and observation, that kind of stuff. Scripture, however, is a supreme foundation. Now, this is the same process that works in every religion, every worldview, every system of thought. Atheists and humanists, in this sense, are just as religious as Christians are. Now, if you make that statement to them, they'll get very angry with you. And they'll get very and they'll say, no, you base things on faith. We base things on science. And the explanation, or the, or the, the reason, or the argument that we turn, we can go back, is, were you there when the heavens and the earth came into being? How do you know that the earth and the, and the universe and the solar system and all the stars and moons and galaxies and all these kind of things, how do you know that they came about by nothing? Because this is what the humanist has to say. The humanist says, one day, there was nothing. And then, all of a sudden, the next day, there was something. Now, we have never actually observed this scientifically. We have never seen nothing cause something. The fact that they believe that nothing can cause something is, in fact, a religious statement. It is something they accept by faith. When you debate and argue and discuss with various atheists and humanists and materialists and those kind of people, they try to squeeze in their premises, their presuppositions, without you even noticing what's going on. In fact, reason itself cannot give you the premises. You have to start with the premises, and then you can reason logically from there. Humanists and materialists begin, and they assume a priori that God does not exist, that everything that is can be explained by impersonal materialism. That is a worldview. That is a premise. There is no God. All explanations are materialistic, can be derived, can be understood, can be developed from, uh, from uh, what we can observe, observe and see and touch and taste around us. They then use this reason to argue from their premises, and usually against Christianity, which they have already normally rejected. In the famous debates with Richard Haw Dawkins and other kind of people, you can see they've already rejected out of hand the inspiration and fallibility, the inerrancy of Scripture, the, the existence of God, etc. To be a Christian requires the same kind of faith. We begin with a premise, a presupposition, an acceptance of certain fundamental premises that God is true, that Jesus is His Son who lived, died, and was resurrected so that we might be saved from our sins, and that the Bible is a faithful, reliable, inerrant story, account of that particular story. Now, when we say this, the problem is that most Christians, and I'm not trying to be nasty or negative when I say this, many Christians, they're not very successful in working out the implications of their faith. Most Christians are very gullible when it comes to believing things. There are too many Christians who do not reason well. And I'm going to offer you an example from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26. It says, For consider your calling, brethren, that not many were wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the mighty. Now basically what God is saying is this. I didn't choose you because you were the smartest people on the planet. Because you had more spiritual insight. Because you were somehow closer to me. But rather I chose the weak and the foolish and, 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 and the, the base of these things in order that I might demonstrate what a gracious and good God I am. And it basically goes on in 1 Corinthians 2, oh, excuse me, 1 Corinthians 1, talk about that God wanted no one to boast except in Him Himself. And therefore, we should not be surprised that amongst the, the average evangelical, Bible-believing, Christ-affirming Christian, often their thinking processes aren't all that good. They just don't think well because they're not the intellectual cream of the crop. And we have to understand that we've got to appreciate that. Not everyone can do the same kind of things. There are things that some people can do and other people can't. There are people who can fix cars. There are people who can wire houses. There are people who can do plumbing. There are people who can, can, can hit a nail without smacking their thumb with a hammer. These are marvelous, wonderful people in life, and I envy them their skills and abilities. But at the same time, we, have, we are responsible, according to first, uh, excuse me, 1 Peter chapter 3, that all of us have to be able to give a reason for why we do what we do, why we believe what we be, what we believe. God did not save us because we're wise or brilliant or powerful, but rather to show his own great love and compassion. However, in, in, in regards to that, he still commands us in humility and grace and kindness to work out the implications of the faith that has been delivered unto us. And therefore, to consistently and powerfully present that message whenever we can. 
Now, I have to put a caveat in here, a proviso, if you will, about various, about how we approach this. Men are not won to the gospel by the power of our rhetoric or the brilliance of our reason. God converts men according to his own goodness and grace and will. 2 Timothy 2, 23 and following, the Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to all, able to teach, patient when wrong, with gentleness correcting those in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. The phrase there that's important is that God grants men repentance. We will never win anyone because we are powerful you know, uh, orators, or we have great rhetoric, or, or because the, the power of our arguments are, is so overwhelming that men must just bend the knee to us and acknowledge the brilliance of it. Think about all the times when you've listened to debates of various people. And especially think of the time when your side of the debate, whatever it might be, political or religious, you know, it might be or any number of issues. And think about when you go, oh, my guy didn't really do such a good job. Yeah, i got to admit that the other guy, the person who believes other than what I believe, he basically won that debate pretty clearly. How often has that changed your fundamental beliefs? Not very often. Debates really are not there to, they're there to examine ideas, but the debates themselves do not convince anyone of anything unless Almighty God himself comes involved, becomes involved and works in a person's heart. According to the late great Greg Bonson who said, all non-Christian worldviews are either arbitrary or contradictory. And this is something we've got to keep in mind. Because what happens is that the Christians are the only ones who have a coherent, consistent, logical worldview based upon our premises. What happens is that the pagan, the materialist, the humanist, he always has to sneak in a Christian presupposition here or there that he's really not involved to be, uh, you know, allowed to be able to do. So he's inconsistent. Or he just asserts that I'm true and you guys are wrong. It is our responsibility not only to have faith, but also to give reasons for that faith whenever and however the opportunity arrives. Because it's, even though it's not our arguments that will win people, it is our defense of the faith that God will use to win people. Do you see the difference there? One is thinking that, oh, we have to be great scholars or great thinkers or great speakers. We have to have all of our you know, intellectual and, and academic information lined up and we shoot them like machine gun bullets into the adversary, you know, into the enemy in order to convert them. No, it doesn't work that way. God has to change the heart. God has to give a person faith. God has to actually bring about a conversion, grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth. But what is the means that God is going to use to accomplish that? Well, a person who lives a humble life before God, who has sanctified Jesus as Lord, and basically lives that life blamelessly, that person's reasons then will be the means by which God works in someone else's life. There is a subtle but an important distinction between the two. Therefore, in this particular series, we'll look at how Christians are supposed to defend the faith. How we give reasons, good reasons, for why we believe what we believe. However, we're going to start within the household of God. Scripture says, the Apostle Paul says, judgment begins with the household of God. In other words, before we start pointing the finger outside at those people out there and tell everyone what terrible, horrible people they are and how bad they are, we first of all need to turn, the, look, look at ourselves in the mirror, turn around, take a look at ourselves. Because it's our own beliefs, our own orientation, our own problems that God's going to begin with. So we need to be humble before God, recognizing that we all fall short. And therefore, rather than by trying to show the reasonableness of Christianity to, say, the atheist or the humanist, we'll start with the reasons why we as Reformed Christians believe as we do. Think about this. In 1800, in the United States, if you looked across all the denominational spectrum across America, probably, according to my studies and my doing my doctorate, about 90% of Americans would claim some sort of Reformed theology as their basic worldview. Today in America, I doubt if we make up less, well, more than 1% of Christians in America. Reformed denominations are tiny. They're insignificant compared to broad evangelicalism. I mean, you know, think about it this way. Uh, First Baptist Church of Dallas, Texas, has more members in that church than the entire Orthodox Presbyterian Church. Okay? Think about that. I mean, the PCA, which is the largest American, you know, uh, quasi-reformed denomination, has about 375, 400,000 members at most. And Southern Baptist, for example, has something like 20 million. 
people who belong to Southern Baptist churches. So you have to ask yourself a question. Are we the intellectual elite? Are we the only ones in the know? What's so special about us that we have this truth? And the argument Kant may be made is that you guys are lost in history. What you believe, these weird doctrines you believe, the doctrines of grace, the five points of Calvinism, which aren't really the five points of Calvinism, they're, they're refutations of the five points of Arminianism that was the center of thought. But, you know, this idea about covenant baptism, all these weird, bizarre things that you believe, aren't they just a, a relic, a hangover of older times? Because most American Christians no longer affirm or believe what we affirm and believe. And so, therefore, we need to do our work. And I'm going to say this, and I'm going to be honest, that basically the reason why we have to do this work, and I suspect the reason why we are such a small, insignificant percentage of American evangelical Christians today, is because our ancestors did not do the job they were supposed to do. They did not defend the faith. They did not give good and adequate reasons. They took too many things by assumption. And when I look at my brother elders in Reformed churches, and I listen to often very well-researched, impeccably executed passages, brilliant insights into the meaning of the text, they're basically, they're, they're like polishing brass on the Titanic, right? They're becoming ever more expert in ever narrower fields of knowledge. And yet they're ignoring the fact that the world itself is dying around us. That is the reason, I think, why we shrank, one of the reasons why we shrank from being so dominant in the past. And so, therefore, in this series, we're going to begin with a study on covenant baptism, which is probably one of the most controversial things that we believe. Most Christians, most, and there are some people who hate us for being Calvinists, but most Christians will basically say, well, yeah, okay, we'll recognize that as, we don't agree with that, but you guys are okay there. Most Christians will have too much of a problem with our church government. A lot of churches, independent churches, have a Presbyterian form of government, in fact, that they have teaching elders and ruling elders and and that kind of thing. Yeah, there you go. They might have a little bit of a problem with the Presbyterian, but that's only because, mostly, let me suggest, because they're not that well organized, and they don't see how it could actually work. They don't have a real big problem. But the one that really sticks in their crawl, that makes them really embarrassed and angry, that makes them really kind of foam at the mouth, is the fact that we baptize our babies. The most gracious thing that I've heard is basically, you guys are just so caught up in tradition, right, you, you just soak up the tradition. You're not willing to see the Bible as it really says. Now, there are a number of different doctrinal issues that we can look at. But covenant baptism becomes an important one. Remember, in order to do this, we have to look at the premises. It isn't the argument itself that's important. Because if the argument is logical, if the premises are true, then the conclusion must necessarily follow. So the real issue is not swapping text with our Baptist brothers but rather to go back and look at the premises. Reason is only a tool. It's a means of determining whether a conclusion is justified by the given premises. Now, this is going to get a little abstract here for a moment, but I just want to throw this out. Let's look at formal logic just for a moment. And this is going to actually become really important in the next few weeks as we start looking at our brother's arguments and making them uh, see whether or not they pass the test. In formal logic, there's a thing called a syllogism. The syllogism consists of two premises and a conclusion. And therefore, <clears throat> basically, if this is true, and that is true, then therefore this must be the conclusion. Right? Uh, so when we talk of things that, that, uh, that something is reasonable or not reasonable, something rational or irrational, it has to do with whether or not the premises themselves are true and whether or not the conclusion follows logically from that premises. Okay, a friend, but however, the problem is, is that the first step in analyzing any argument is to determine whether the premises or the presuppositions are in fact true. Right? You got this, okay? If this is true, and this is true, then this logically must be the necessary conclusion. But how do you know whether the premises are in fact true? For example, something that I've seen demonstrated over the years, it's almost, psychology is a bankrupt discipline, don't get me wrong on it, I have two degrees in it. It's a bankrupt discipline, but the cutting edge in the psychology of learning indicates that people are more likely to attune to data that confirms their beliefs to suppress, deny, or ignore data that would overturn their beliefs. Basically, remember I gave you the example about listening to a debate? 
And even if your guy loses the debate, you don't suddenly change your convictions. You just say, oh, well, that guy didn't do a very good job. And so, you know what? Yeah, but my beliefs are still the same. And that's because this thing called confirmation bias is working inside all of us. In other words, we tend to select data that confirms our beliefs, and we reject data that might overturn our beliefs. Furthermore, there are premises that just cannot be proven, but they're simply accepted. And if you deny those premises, you are going to invite ridicule, condemnation, and even persecution. What if I were to say to you, the world is flat? You'd giggle at me. You'd say, that's ridiculous. That's outrageous. That's not true. However, have you ever actually done any investigation? Now, by the way, just to make sure that nobody misunderstands it, I don't believe the world is flat. Okay, I believe the world is a globe, right? I'm still a bit up, in, you know, I'm up in the air about whether or not we live in a heliocentric or, you know, our Earth-centered universe, and I think there are arguments that can be made because it's all a matter of relativity, as Einstein said so many years ago. But the idea is that you would actually laugh at the idea that the world is flat. But if you actually go onto YouTube and type in flat Earth, you'll get a number of, vi of uh, uh, videos that will come up where people seriously do propose that the Earth is in fact flat. And then you go, but wait a minute, we've actually sent astronauts to the moon. Oh, you just think they've sent the astronauts to the moon. Did you know that NASA is in fact one grand conspiracy? And depending on who you listen to, it might be Illuminati, it might be devil worshippers, it might be, you know, a big fraud or whatever. It might be any number of reasons why it might be the Antichrist, the 666, trying to deny it, that kind of stuff. But the thing is, as long as you're willing to accept the premise that there is a grand conspiracy to hide knowledge from the average person, then you can add the next premise to it, and then you can arrive at what is a conclusion that may seem to be outrageous. And this is something that if you take nothing else from this evening, take this home. Something is plausible, or something is credible, only to the degree that it is acceptable. Okay? Now here's a statement. Credibility is a sociological statement, not a rational one. What do I mean by that? In other words, we tend to find certain things believable because they fit within our own presuppositions. And because of that confirmation bias that we said earlier, we tend to take data that comes in and we either assimilate it or we ignore it or we pretend it's not there or we, we downplay it or we just reject it if it doesn't fit with what we already think is true. And my famous example of this is a man named Semmelweis in the 19th century who worked in a hospital and there was a real big problem in those days because for the first time, women were not having babies at home with midwives, but the doctors were starting to build their profession and they would bring women in to hospitals to have babies. Now, this was, you know, mid-19th century, and basically what they would do is the doctors would go from one birth to another. They might or might not, wrap, you know, take a rag and wipe their hands off, but nobody ever sterilized instruments because the germ theory was not yet common. And basically what they would do is they would end up finding that they had a high infant mortality rate. They would have a high number of women who would die. And basically whole hospital wards would be decimated by these doctors carrying disease from one person to another. Semmelweis basically said, hmm, there's something going on here. You know, maybe it's something that we're carrying from one person to another. Hey guys, let's wash our hands between patients. Now, you've got to remember, this is the time when in battlefields, for example, battlefield surgeons, a guy would come in with a gunshot, the only way they had of dealing with someone who got shot like the arm or the leg was to hack the leg off. And basically, their method of, of cleaning was to take a bucket of water and slosh it on the operating table to wash the blood off before they dropped the next patient down and started cutting. The doctor wouldn't even wash his hands. And that's why most people died of infections. It wasn't the actual bullet wound, but it was the infection that killed them. So they didn't really understand these things. When Semmelweis announced this, he actually had good scientific evidence demonstrated that doctors who washed their hands between patients had a far lesser incidence of, you know, I forget exactly what the disease was, it was called but something like, like a, a birthing disease or something like that. But anyway, he could demonstrate empirically. So the entire world rejoiced and they said, look, we can save mothers and babies from horrible things because we now have this new technique. Semmelweis was ridiculed and basically driven insane for simply telling doctors to wash their hands between patients. 
Medical science needs to remember this because what's the cutting edge of medical science today is often ridiculed 20 or 30 years later. When I was going through my undergraduate work in the 1970s, we had to watch, as a part of our educational process, we had to watch a number of films on various kinds of things. And one of the films that we watched was on doing a lobotomy. Lobotomies were still being practiced. If you don't know what a lobotomy is, it's basically where they, they had two ways, of, several different ways of doing it. One way, the old fashioned way they did in the 40s and 50s, is they would literally drill a hole in your head and then reach in with a sharp surgical tool and go in order to kill the brain cells. And guess what? If you had hysteria or mania or some kind of really bizarre behavior, by killing a portion of your brain, the patient usually calmed real down. You didn't get drug up anymore. Now, by the time that I got into my undergraduate work, they, had, they were no longer doing that. That's a very barbaric thing. Now, what they do is they actually reach in behind, they didn't have to cut a hole anymore, they actually reached in behind the eyeball, and they would, with a little thin tool, and they would put it up there and scoop out a little bit of it and pull a bit of brain out. And the same kind of thing. Every single scientist that I know, every single psychologist, psychiatrist, surgeon today would reject this as a barbaric thing. Electroconvulsive therapy was still being practiced in the 1970s. Electroconvulsive therapies, they found that basically if you tied someone down and stuck a, a rubber gag in their mouth and then applied, you know, judicious you know, amounts of electricity to the sides of their heads, that it would scramble their brains and it was a, a common cure for depression. Because think about it. I mean, uh, are you depressed? No, no, no. Well, let's have some more anyway. The fact is, is that I think. You know, ECT is now basically routinely condemned. It's a barbaric practice. But at the time, it was the cutting edge of science and technology. Remember the famous scope trials in the 1920s, where <clears throat> basically, you know, there's an old thing about Tennessee and teaching evolution, and, you know, basically the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the creationists won. Well, the thing that was interesting is that almost every single bit of evidence that was put forward by, by it was a sad job, by the way, Scopes trial was an attempt to basically challenge the law in Tennessee. But every single bit of scientific evidence that has, was used to advocate for evolution over creation has turned out a hundred years later to be completely false. Nobody believes today what the evolutionists believe. They don't use the same evidence that they did in 1920 or 1926, whatever it was. Point is, is that you are ridiculed if your beliefs, your premises, don't fit within the context of what other people find acceptable. That works for other people, and it works for us. And I think that's one of the reasons why Scripture tells us that we're supposed to be gentle and gracious and humble. Because we don't always know what we think we know. And so therefore, simply because something seems to be incredible doesn't necessarily mean that it's wrong. I remember, now I'm not, I don't know if there's very many people here who are old enough to remember, but I remember 1969. I remember watching the moon landings. It was in black and white on our television set. And it was there, and my older brother, who's 11 years older than me, he passed away a long time ago, and you know, all these people were watching the moon landings, live transmissions from the moon. And my brother said, I don't believe it, my brother Joe. Didn't happen. They filmed that on some back lot in California. That is not happening. It's not true. You cannot fly. Now, my brother was not an intellectual. Uh, he dropped out of high school. He, I don't think he ever read a book. Well, I take it back. I think he liked Archie comics. Uh, so, but he never read a book that didn't have pictures in it. You know, he's a great guy. He could do practically anything with his hands, but, but he was not what they would call an intellectual heavyweight. But he refused to believe what he was seeing. He thought it was a it was a, a hoax. He thought it was something that was made up because he didn't believe that things like rocket ships could actually fly. I got so much flack from my family in the 1960s because I would go to the library and I would get these books and the books would have a little, little rocket on the side of them. And my, they were science fiction stories. And my parents and my friends and my, my family, they would ridicule because obviously rocket ships are stupid. They can't work. Now this, guys, is 20 years after the end of World War II. 20 years after the Germans had been bombing London with rockets. This is 10 years after, well, not quite, but about five years after, you know, Russia had put the first Sputnik into space. 
It's like five years after we had actually had a man. I was in the first grade, 1960, when the first, you know, first American in space happened. And yet, at that point, most people in rural Maine, and that may say a lot right there, did not believe that space travel was possible, and anyone who read books about it must be an idiot. I got so much flack for watching Star Trek when it first came. My dad would come in and look at that and say, why are you watching that nonsense? That's completely ridiculous. It's not, you know, it's so stupid. And actually, you know, okay, there's a lot of ridiculousness in Star Trek. But today, there's a, there's a great uh, uh, documentary called How Star Trek Changed the World. And basically, it's William Shatner talking about all the stuff that they do. Remember, this is actually too far past. You guys don't even use these. Some of you younger people don't even know what I'm talking about. Do you know that there used to be these things called disks that you put in your computer? And they were little black things, you put them in and you save data. Now those were a great improvement, the, you know, the little disk, the hard disk, over the big floppy disk that we had to use in the beginning. But do you know where the idea for that little disk came from? It came from Star Trek. If you watch the original series, they were always slipping disks into the computer to give it data or to get data back from it. Think about the way that most people use flip phones. They're now obsolete. Most of us have phones like this today. And I, I got one just so I could be one of the cool kids now. And, uh, but you know, the phone I used right up until like a month ago was a little flip phone. And what does it look like? It looks like the, the communicator from Star Trek. And they self-consciously decided to do that. Guys, what I'm saying here is that something that seemed to be ridiculous, unbelievable, inconceivable 50 years ago is now taken to be a piece of obsolete technology that we smile at in memory. Credibility is not the same thing as truth. Credibility simply says more about what you're willing to believe, not about what actually may be believed. People tend to believe what, they talk, what they're taught. And often, they don't look at the data. Now, there's a reason for that, okay? None of us has the time or the talent to be at square one and learn all the things that we need to learn. We can see much further today than our ancestors could because we're standing on their shoulders. Their insight, their learning, their experiences have given us a rich cultural heritage so that we're able to do things and see things and envision things that they possibly couldn't. But remember, it was 1908 when the Wright brothers made their first flight, which was widely universally ridiculed as something to be impossible. Right up there with perpetual motion machines. And yet, 60 years later, we're sending men to the moon. So within a period of 60 years, the entire world underwent a change. We can't possibly learn all those things by ourselves. And so we have to recognize when our brothers out there in the world, they have a difficult time because they're only passing on to us what they have been taught. They've never had the opportunity to study these things in detail for themselves. Now again, we're running out of time here this evening, but one final particular comment in regards to this. The most significant movement inside evangelical, that means Bible-believing Christianity, in the past 200 and something years, is a movement called Pietism. Originally it began in Germany, when German Christians were being really weighed down with scholasticism and you know, doctrine, and, they, and it came at the end of, of 150 years of religious wars where people were killing each other. Remember, in Germany especially, the battles between Roman Catholic and, Christ, and the Protestant, excuse me, were really nasty. In the Thirty Years' War, there were portions of Germany that were virtually depopulated as army after army marched through. People were tired of fighting over doctrine. And therefore, and they began in various places in Germany, but the movement became known as Pietism, and the idea that the essence of the Christian life is not about doctrine or theology, but it's about experiencing God. And the first Pietists, they used to meet together, and they did something like the following. They would sing a psalm or a hymn, they would have a time of prayer, and they would look at a Bible verse, and they'd all share their thoughts about what that Bible verse meant to them. Now, does that sound radical? Does that sound, sounds kind of pretty much like what every single evangelical Christian does today. To us, that's what church is. We meet together, we sing, and you know, we share and we encourage one another, and we listen to the Word of God. Except the emphasis had changed from understanding what God's Word said to how does it apply to me? How does it make me feel? And in that sense, pietism was about, not about piety, piety is a good thing, but rather it's about, about embracing the un unseen. It's about trying to get in touch with the eternal. 
And so prayer and meditation and Bible study were seen as tools to arrive at a certain feeling about God. Now, in and of itself, it wasn't a bad thing. It wasn't a terrible thing. It wasn't a horrible thing. But as time went on, it increasingly became the, the sine qua non, the, the whole basis of what Christians say. That's why if you talk to average Christians, they don't want to talk about theology. They don't want to talk about doctrine. They don't care. Why is it if you go to a big church today, not this a big church, that the average worship service may consist of something like 45 minutes of singing certain repetitive songs over and over and over again. Now, they don't intend to do this. That's not their, they don't plan it, you know, that way. But in reality, what they're doing is a very well-known psychological technique which basically induces a certain kind of brain wave by doing certain repetitive things. It all can be demonstrated academically that this is exactly what they're doing. It's the same kind of things that tribes do in Africa when they jump up and down with their spears and they chant and they chant and they get to work themselves up into a fervor. It's the same kind of things that the dervishes, you ever heard of the whirling dervishes? They were a crime of people who would, who would basically, they would spin around in circles and spin, and spin and spin and spin and spin and spin until basically they lost almost all consciousness. And they would induce in themselves a tremendously important, significant to them, spiritual experience. It is a well-researched psychological phenomenon. And Christians are doing the exact same thing, except for them, they think they're getting in touch with the transcendent. So when it comes to looking at defending their faith, their faith is basically this. Try it. It's nice. You'll like it. Come with us. Sing our songs, right? You know, experience our thing. And, and you'll too have this great, wonderful, tremendous, you know, in experience. We, however, have to be something better than that. We need to be able to go back to the scriptures. The heritage that's been laid down to us from the reformers, from the men who died literally for possessing a copy of the Bible is that God's word is true. And if you love God, you've got to love his word. You've got to understand his word. It's not just about abstract theology. It's never just about having intellectual apprehension. Obviously, we have to make practical application. We talk about that literally ad nauseum every single Sunday morning. But we do have to be able to defend why we believe what we believe. It's not enough to say I believe it, we also have to be able to explain it. So therefore, before we can begin analyzing the arguments for or against various forms of baptism, we have to examine our underlying presuppositions. What baptism is, what it does, and what it means. And that's part of the problem. Why is it out of like something like 40 to 60 million, depending upon the, the, the survey, evangelical Christians in America, why do probably you know, 39 million of them reject covenant baptism? Well, we need to understand that. And we need to explain what, what presupposition they're bringing to the text. You see, the issue is never, for us Christians anyway, it's never about the authority of God's word. It's never about the ins inerrancy, inspiration, or infallibility of God's word. But rather, it's what do you believe the Bible teaches. And that's a pretty significant difference. Because we all agree that the Bible is God's word. The question is, what do you believe the Bible teaches about something? So we're going to begin uh, next week by looking at three fundamental presuppositions that first must be investigated before we can then proceed to discuss what the Bible says about baptism. The first one is continuity versus discontinuity. And then what we mean by that is what's the nature of God's revelation in the Bible? Most Christians, if you go and talk to them, and I've had this thrown at me so many times, I'll quote something from the Old Testament and I'll go, oh, that's Old Testament. That's nothing to do with us. I'm a New Testament Christian. In fact, if you look in the phone book or on Google and you look up New Testament church, you'll probably find there are probably a dozen or so here in a small town of Evansville itself. They pride themselves in being New Testament. Is that, in fact, a valid way to deal with God's revelation of Scripture? Does God's Word itself say, this is how I want you to view my Word? And so there's an issue here of whether or not we see what's happening in the New Testament as something radical, new, and different, or whether or not we see, as the historical Christians have done, that the Old Testament is a logical, reasonable continuation of what God has been doing in the Old Testament. We'll look at those presuppositions next week. Second of all, the uh, assumption that's made is that baptism is something unique. It's something different. It's something new. Now, this is kind of related to the above, 
But basically, when you talk to a lot of our Baptist brothers, they'll basically say, no, this is something new and wonderful. It wasn't revealed before. It's something brand new. And, and therefore, there's all sorts of different ways of looking at it than what you guys do. And our assumption is, or, or our argument is, well, is that necessarily true? Is baptism something that you only find in the New Testament? And again, we'll talk about this more next week, but here's the argument. Think about this. God institutes this sacrament of baptism in the New Testament. But do you know, no matter where you go, you never find a single description of what baptism actually looked like. If our Baptist brothers are clear, and they're right, that baptism is only be by immersion, and only those people who are actually, you know, make professions of faith, then why doesn't God ever actually say that in the New Testament? He doesn't. You never get a picture. If this was a brand new radical thing, why doesn't someone explain to us in unambiguous language what this new thing is? It just sort of assumes that you know what baptism is the first time it appears in the New Testament. We'll talk more about that next week. And finally, what is the meaning of baptism? As a former Baptist minister, I conducted numerous baptisms in my time before God gave me some grace and I saw things in Scripture that I'd never seen before. Does it mirror the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus? And that's the formula that we used. When I used to stand in the big, you know, you know, bathtub there in front of the church, and I would have people, and we had these white gowns that they would wear, and we would, you know, take them up in the water, and we would put them under the water, right, and go buried with Christ with baptism, raised with Christ in new life. That's the predominant assumption. That was the assumption that that's the purpose of this. It's identifying with the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. But is that actually what the New Testament says? Does the Bible actually tell us that this is what it's supposed to be? There are a couple of verses that are interesting in this regard, but is that really the meaning we're supposed to have? Well, how do we know? Well, we'll look at that information. Guys, the purpose of this particular series is not to castigate, humiliate, or attack our Baptist brothers. We affirm fully and completely that they are full Christians, those who confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in their heart that God raised from the dead, they are saved, and therefore they are our brothers. But remember what God said, what Jesus said in his prayer in John 17, 17. Thy word is truth. God is true. And untruth, no matter how piously they may be held, cannot help but cause us problems. The better we understand what God himself has said, the better we will be able to bring our lives into conformity to him. The more that we understand the better defense we can give of the hope that is within us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you and praise you and glorify your name. We ask, Lord, that you give us grace that we might approach this study not uh, being condescending or arrogant or vicious towards our brothers, but rather, Lord, to give that word of defense, um, to do it, O oh Lord, with grace and goodness and charity, at the same time, Lord, that we might grow in respect to our salvation. Thank you, King Jesus. Amen. Okay, questions? I know this is, this, I trust, I believe me, this is the most academic of the, the lectures. Dan, is there a question or are you just waiting? No, I'm just saying, that's what <laughs> Well, you know, if you work hard, you can be one of the cool kids. <laughs> I'll even go farther. It's been doused in diesel fuel, with all the crane, and not too long ago, so, it's a back of cell phone. It has, it has new life, yes. Questions, comments, criticisms, complaints? Yes, was the one with the charismatic in the back. She hasn't learned to roll yet. Okay, you are dismissed.